Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to our second Cavalier conversation on science communication of the semester. Um, my name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of journalism here at NYU, the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program and the Science Communication Workshops. Uh, you are here at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute at, at NYU. Uh, we're pleased that C-SPAN is here with us, as well as our usual live streaming. And we would encourage those of you who are watching the live stream to uh, tweet questions using the hashtag CavliConvo uh, hashtag. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Marty McCary and uh, also Laura Beal with us both of whom have found ways to do great journalism, great reporting, uh, while also accruing very large audiences. Uh, we have a number of people in the room who would love to do exactly that, uh, as well as people who are joining us online. Our host, as always, is Robert Lee Holtz of the Wall Street Journal, who is also a distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute. He'll uh, moderate the discussion and also do the introductions. So take it away, Lee. Thank you, sir. So welcome to the Cavalier Conversations on Science Communications. Our purpose here is to dig in to how we report the story of science and medicine. And to do that, we bring together the best in science journalism, the best in science communications, to explore how new research reaches the public. What can journalists learn about reporting from scientists? What can scientists learn about sharing their work from those who cover them closely? And what do their differing perspectives tell us about how the news of science is changing, how it reaches the popular culture, and how journalists and scientists and doctors might do the whole thing a lot better than we do now? So to uh, uh, re re repeat, the, these conversations are sponsored by the Cavalier Foundation and uh, the NYU Science, Health, Environment, and Reporting Program under the leadership of Dan Fagan, whom you just met a second ago. So this is the second in our spring series. Uh, looking forward, on March 27th, we bring together producers Joss Fong and from Vox, uh, Joss Fong from Vox, and Anna Rothschild from the Washington Post to unpack the trade secrets of science videos that reach millions of viewers. On April 24th, we're going to probe um, coverage of behavior uh, and misbehavior with psychologist Brian Nosick from UVA's Center for Open Science and NPR reporter and podcaster Alex Siegel, whose Invisibilia podcast has been averaging a million downloads weekly. But tonight, we consider a public matter of life and death, the hazards <coughs> of American health care. Bad doctors, medical mistakes, crushing costs, and a lack of transparency that too often shields them. We're going to conduct a media autopsy. And as we go, I encourage you all to offer your questions. Use the microphone, please, so those of us who are watching online can join in, and you in the invisible beyond there can tweet your questions to us using the hashtag CavaliConvo. So, for this conversation tonight, we're joined by one of the most influential voices in medical coverage, and I do mean voice. Uh, Laura Beale is the reporter and narrator of the six-part podcast, Dr. Death. Um, it's a tale of willful medical malpractice, which at last count had been downloaded about 30 million times. Uh, joining us from Texas tonight, uh, Laura is a veteran, award-winning uh, freelance health and science writer, and most recently, she won the uh, very prestigious 2018 Victor Cohn Prize for Excellence in Medical Science Reporting from the Council for the Advancement of Science Writing. And uh, by her side, one of the nation's leading healthcare critics surgeon and health policy professor Marty McCary from Johns Hopkins University. He's author of Unaccountable, 
what hospitals won't tell you, and how transparency can revolutionize healthcare, which explores a medical culture that routinely leaves surgical sponges inside patients, amputates the wrong leg, and overdoses children because of sloppy handwriting. His forthcoming book, which I am proud to have a copy of right here, is called The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix It. It's coming out, I believe, in September. Forbes, you may be interested to know, calls this a must read for every American and business leader. So each of you is conducting experiments in the public understanding of science and medicine. So I want to treat you as our first specimen slide. Laura, okay. put you under the microscope here for a second. I want to ask you a little bit about your work with Dr. Death. And I want to begin by saying this is just the strangest assignment I've ever heard of. I mean, the story was already well reported. Um, the doctor in question had already sort of been grabbed by the collar and brought to justice. And you were given this assignment by podcasting company, and you have virtually no podcasting experience. Uh, Can you tell me a tiny, well, a smidgen? Let's go. Yeah. It was under a microscope, so let's call it a smidgen. You have a smidgen of podcasting experience. How on earth did this come to be? Um, it, it completely fell in my lap one day. I'm a print reporter, and um, I was contacted by Wendry, which is a company that makes podcasts, and they had heard the story of, of Christopher Dent from a listener of a previous podcast. They had done a podcast called Dirty John which had been successful. They did that in cooperation with the Los Angeles Times. And a listener from Dirty John emailed them and said, um, have you heard of Christopher Dunch? And they had not. Uh, because even though the story got a ton of media attention locally in the Dallas area, it hadn't gotten, a, it had gotten some, but not a lot of national attention. So now he's a, was a or was, I suppose I should say. A surgeon. A back right. surgeon, yes. Right, he was a back surgeon, and as you might guess from the title of the podcast, he was not a very good back surgeon. And I mean, he killed people. Yes, yes, two people. Um, and he only had, uh, he had less than 40 patients. Uh, more than 30 of them ended up injured. And, um, and two died. And so, so they contacted me to tell this story about what happened. And my first reaction is, I'm a print reporter. <laughs> you know, I don't know anything about telling an audio story. I know a lot more now than I did then. Um, and, um, and that was only the first challenge of trying to do this, is my own technical fault. Uh, um, part of it was doing a story, as you alluded to, how do you tell a story that people already think they know? I mean, this was a story that was already out there, the ending was out there, how do you start out, um, you know, from the first five minutes, anyone could Google it and figure out what happened. So you didn't have that, you know, kind of suspense that you do with some podcasts where you really don't know what's gonna, what's gonna happen. Um, and, uh, and they, Wondery was willing to take a chance on me. I was willing to take a chance on them. I had never heard of Wondery. I had not listened to Dirty John. Um, so th we had to trust each other to, to tell this story. And they, they ended up being great and supportive. And they're, they're not a journalism organization. No, they're not. They're, they, which I also was, was a little leery of, but they work with journalists. And since I, I've done my part, I mean, they, they have, now worked with a lot of journalists, and so they're not a journalism organization. Uh, they don't pretend to be a journalism organization, and yet they respect and support all the tenets of journalism that that um, let you tell a good so, story. So this was, I, I just want to make sure I understand correctly, this was not like a clip job. I mean, they didn't ask you to just go to Google no. and, and uh, uh, pull down what's already been covered and give us a script. No. They asked you to re-report it from scratch, is that right? Yes. And it was going to take, I mean, it was pretty clear given the scope of the story. So I'm a freelancer. So if you're a freelancer, your time, you're not, you don't get paid by the hour. And so, so they were asking me to commit months and months of my time to telling this story 
doing it in an, in a format that I had never I had never used. I did have one experience uh, telling an audio story from uh, This American Life. I had done an episode oh, right. mm -hmm. uh, a, a few years ago, and um, and I, I again knew knew nothing. I learned some from from working with them because. At This American Life, they're just so good at telling audio stories. I learned a little bit from that, but it was nothing. I mean, that was a 30-minute episode. This was hours of, this was hours of content. How did that affect together. how you reported this? So the reporting itself was the same in terms of who you go to for sources, where you get documents from. That didn't change. Mm -hmm. You know, reporting is reporting, no matter what what platform you do it on. What did change is how you interview, how you ask questions. Um, that was different. Um, and just the recording process itself. I mean, I signed off for this thinking that it was going to be like the same um, process that This American Life was, where there was an audio producer there doing the recording. And, and um, so I would just do what I would normally do, Someone else was doing the recording, and and all would be and all would be well. And so you can imagine my terror a week after I agreed to do this, um, when I get an email that says, "Okay, here's the FedEx tracking number for your recording equipment." And I had never, I had never used any of recording equipment other than you know my phone before. Can, can you give us a quick thumbnail for those of us who haven't? heard the, the six parts of this podcast, and I highly recommend that, that you do listen to it. Um, just give us a little thumbnail of just how bad a bad doctor can be. Yeah, so, and, and it's in, that's a good question because that's what I really had to establish in the first episode. So those of you who have listened have know the first episode is pretty tough. It's pretty tough. It's somewhat graphic to describe because I thought to understand the story you have to understand how bad a mm -hmm. surgeon that he was. So he was making mistakes that surgeons, you know, Dr. McCarry well, never that? make, like never make, like, you know, putting, for example, he was a back surgeon so he's putting uh, hardware into, into a patient's back and it's supposed to be screwed into bone and into the hardware itself to get it together. So in one surgery, he put a screw into a back muscle and screwed it into this woman's muscle. Um, he sewed, he left a sponge inside one patient's. He would, he would I, I had doctors tell me that he didn't even seem to know basic anatomy because he had this habit of cutting vertebral arteries on patients, which he did several times. And in fact, one of his patients who died, she actually bled to death. Uh, in the recovery room, because it was a, so he 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 was he he was so bad that the uh, one doctor who came along behind him and saw um, how bad he had done thought he had to be an imposter because no one could have finished medical school and been this bad. Like somebody could have come in off the street and, and done this. I mean, that's how terrible he was. I'm going to ask you about this, just no, but I want to just to conclude this little bit here. So how could a surgeon as inept and as dangerous as you've described, um, how could that doctor be allowed to harm dozens of patients before he's stopped? I mean, aren't there, you know, boards well, and procedures and hospital and that, reviews? And that's and, the central question mm -hmm. of the podcast because yeah. It, it became clear within, you know, very little reporting that this was not a story, this was not a story about Christopher Dunch. I mean, that's the thing about the podcast. It's not a story about Dunch. It's a story about our healthcare system and, and how he operated for almost two years in, in Dallas and he was passed from hospital to hospital and there were safeguards that failed at, at every turn and, and that's the central question of the podcast, is how, mm -hmm. how did this happen? I've described it as, you know, unlike some like crime podcast, because ultimately he was c convicted in a criminal court. This wasn't a whodunit. You, you, knew, you knew who was, you know, you knew who did it from the first podcast, but it was a why done it. How did this happen? How did this happen? How did this happen? Marnie, you've written 
a lot on this topic, both in the kind of academic, traditional medical press, but also in the general press for us. And your first book, Accountable, really looks at this question of what we, if you call it medical error, it almost kind of uplifts it and dignifies it. But could this happen with any other problem doctors? Is there something unusual about this case, or is this a problem that many hospitals wrestle with in, in your experience? Well, uh, that's a great question. And first of all, Lee, thanks for having me here. And it's great to be at a um, place that does great journalism. So it's great to be here with Laura, who I remember from her reporting at Men's Health. The reason I love the Dr. Death podcast so much is that it tells a broader story of what's wrong with the accountability within the profession. Now, first of all, most doctors are good people and Absolutely. always try to do the right thing or the vast majority of the time are trying to do the right thing. That's, that's most doctors. And one struggle that those of us who write about quality and safety, and I talk to, I've talked to Atul Gawande a lot about this as we sort of evolve together as mm -hmm. you know, writers and researchers in parallel, um, has been how do you prevent sensationalism? Because you don't want to create hysteria out there. And even sometimes the, the publicists behind the books or the editors that throw the titles mm -hmm. on the articles in the newspapers all of a sudden um, throw the most sensational thing out there. And then we're sort of seen as creating hysteria and you get sort of, that has always been a challenge. Um, even in the, the write-up about unaccountable, referring to doctors kill people with sloppy handwriting. Well, that's 10 years ago. We don't use handwriting anymore. We don't rely on well, it. It's because we've changed to electronic health records, we've changed, which yeah. cause different problems. Exactly. The handwriting is still bad. And we have a whole bunch of problems, and our handwriting yeah. is still bad. <laughs> yeah. But patients aren't really dying. To, so there's a Bermuda Triangle in medicine right. of accountability. The hospitals will say, well, it's really the state medical boards that have to police this. The state medical boards will say, it's really the professional physician associations that need to police this. And they'll say, well, it's really the hospital and their department right, chairs. Right. And what you have is a giant black hole, and then you have some case like the Dr. Death story that really exposes not one individual, because the bad apples are out there, but um, you know, that's not the majority. How does that happen, and how does it continue to happen? I just came back from a meeting of neurosurgeons. A uh, professional neurosurgery association invited me to be a keynote speaker the night before they take you out to dinner. And in that dinner, the doctors start talking. And once they start talking and uh, a drink or two is in their system, they start to be very honest. And within an hour or two, they start to unload and tell you this fee-for-service system that measures us and pays us by the most spine operations or the most neurosurgery operations that we do is driving all of my partners to do unnecessary surgery. And they, this is just this week. They start telling me and story after individual, after case, after patient they saw who they recommended no surgery, who then sees another one of their partners who says, I can t help you here. Okay. And you start to realize the problem in healthcare right now that dominates the field is not the one-off, it's the incentive structure that is resulting in a mass epidemic of inappropriate medical care. If you looked at the number of prescriptions we doctors prescribed 10 years ago, it was 2.4 billion. Last year, it hit almost 5 billion. Did disease double in 10 years? No, we have a crisis of appropriateness. We're you know, seeing patients in 10, 15 minute segments where they're demanding things. The, the problem of appropriateness in healthcare is one that gets little attention, but is one of the biggest drivers mm -hmm. of an industry that is now the number one industry in the United States. That's true. In your book, Unaccountable, you make a point of discussing how difficult it is for us, for patients, for consumers. For you, when you were you know, not uh, the, the, the practitioner, you're the one being practiced upon, to get access to treatment costs, to error incident rates, complications, infection rates, and stuff. I mean, uh, I saw a testimony of yours 
um, to Congress a couple of years ago, where you, I think, said there was something on the order of 150 different registers that actually track patient outcomes. And a quarter of them we actually pay for. They're actually taxpayer funded. Um, and yet, almost none of those outcomes are made public. Now, this is a conversation about bad medicine, but it's not just about the problem of bad medicine. It's the problem of how come this story, which has been told so often, because forgive me, you're not the first medical writer, as I know you know, to come across a bad doctor, and you're not the first doctor who's called attention to this. What is it about this story, or what is it about how we tell this story that somehow keeps us in a loop? Is it just a transparency problem? I think so. You know, medicine, one of the complicating factors is that medicine is an art. It's not like flying a plane. Stuff comes up. And you want to tailor your treatment to an individual patient and their needs and goals. So it's not a recipe. So if we measure outcomes, it, they've got to be sort of, fat, we've got to factor in the complexity of the patient and their unique situation and their social situation and how sick were they. And that, what we call in the quality sciences, risk adjustment is never really perfect. And we've used that as an excuse to say, okay, let's not, let's not do any measurement. And by the way, measurement is not aligned with any stakeholder. No individual stakeholder in healthcare says, we need to measure every single operation that's ever been done, um, that will be done with this new device. When the robot came out, something Laura's written about, why were we not measuring the outcomes of every patient that had surgery with the robot from day one that it was introduced? If we did, it wouldn't have take, taken 10 years for our research group to blow the whistle and say, hey, wait a minute, it's sometimes dangerous, it has no benefit in a whole host of operations, and it's costing a ton more money than the standard treatment, which is pretty good. Not for every operation, but for many. We were not measuring our outcomes. 99% of healthcare today is still unmeasured. Go have a knee replacement at a hospital. Okay. They will not be tracking how you do at six months and a year. So, Laura. Well, and one of the things to, to Marty's point is that um, the instruments that we do have as patients um, are completely inaccurate and misrepresented, which is what do you, how do you find a doctor? You, you do the same way as you want to do when you find a restaurant. Right, I'm going to call you and say, uh, right. or you start who did your knee, Laura? Right, and, and, or you look online and some of these rating tools. So, so consider that Christopher Dunch, who's most, who the vast majority of his patients ended up paralyzed or dead, had, had 4.5 stars on health grades. Are you kidding? No, no, I have a screenshot from it. So it's like even in all of his patients, one of the striking things about it is that all of his patients thought they were researching him, including the very last patient. Um, he looked online, he, he searched every tool that he possibly could. He found the patient, the patient testimonials, the equivalent of how did he do with you. He found those online. He found uh, a video that looked like he had gotten an award, which turned out to be just an infomercial, but as a patient, you don't know that. And by the time that he was researching him, remember, he had, Dunch had 32 other patients over 18 months who were in terrible shape. But he thinks from what he can tell, from what we as patients can tell, he, his, the last patient didn't do anything different than you or I would do. Um, he thinks he's fine. He goes into the surgery with him, you know, um, Dunch cuts a vertebral artery, stuffs a sponge in the hole, and sews him up sponge and all, and, and he almost dies. You so know? you're reporting this, and this other people have reported this. Yes. And you go to the hospitals, because yes. there was more than one hospital, right? Yes. And what do they say? Well, th that hospital um, has closed. You know, that hospital has closed. And the other hospitals, in my story, weren't talking, as you might imagine. So they, they weren't talking, and so I, I don't know. And the big question, too, is these websites, like Dutch use and the doctors, all doctors use, you know, um, you know, he obviously had a carefully curated internet presence. 
you know, that, you know, the reviews, some of them were fake, and, and a lot of these online tools, I think, are a disservice to patients because patients don't know, patients don't know that they can be manipulated, they don't know that they can be scrubbed, uh, and yet, that's all we've got. So, I, I want to explore this deep both here for a minute. So, you are a newbie as a podcaster. Um, the story is well plowed, it's well developed. How did you proceed in your reporting to make it fresh? What kinds of things did you do? Is it just the actuality of voices on tape that make this such a compelling podcast? Well, I mean, what, what does it do to your reporting? That was a big decision. Like, I had to decide in telling the story, am I going to tell it assuming that people know how it comes out because it has been covered, or am I going to assume that people know nothing? And I made a conscious decision to go into it fresh and assume that people knew nothing. And I wasn't going to pay attention to anything else that had been reported before. I also made a decision because it had been reported before that in order to make the story worthwhile, I had to, to dig up information that had not been. And I had to find and I had to find things that had not been, and I had to really explore this territory which had not been, which is how this happened, how these safeguards um, didn't, didn't work. And, and every safeguard that was in place, they all broke down. I mean, and, and Christopher Dunch was, he was an obvious outlier. I mean, mm -hmm. the vast majority of surgeons are good, capable, people who care about their patients. Thank he was you. an outlier, <laughs> but, but he exposed larger right. truths but, about and, the and yes, thank you, true, they're all great, but it was, of course, you. I saw a paper of yours in which you kind of worked out that the medical error is really like the third leading cause of death in the United States. So there are a lot of great doctors out there. I'm not, we're not trying to malign the profession as a whole. What we're trying to do is figure out why, as journalists and as public intellectuals, policy people, we can't somehow get the system, whatever that is, to respond in a useful way. So you, you don't need to defend. We, we, we get it. <laughs> we understand. We all have doctors we like and trust and respect. Um, don't undercut your own work. <laughs> so, no, so what did, are the... Go ahead, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. But I did make a decision that I just was going to assume that people were starting from, from, ground, from ground zero. Okay. Uh, but telling a podcast, so I l started listening to a lot of podcasts after I got the assignment because just to listen. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of the tools that other journalists telling stories have. For example, you know, there were not going to be any plot twists. You know, the, the guy who you think is guilty, he really was guilty. There, were not, there was not going to be a surprise ending. There was not going to be you know, any, anything that a lot of podcasts have that kind of keep mm -hmm. them going. It mm -hmm. was, a, you know, a story that you already think you knew. And so I knew that the one thing that I had to do was just, you know, report it to, you know, just report it to the nth degree that I could and get the information that I could. Because that was the only thing that really I had going for me that the, the whole success of the story depended on, was that you might think you know the story because you could Google it, but you really don't know this. You mm -hmm. really don't know mm -hmm. it. And so I was digging out a lot of, I had to dig out a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that nobody had ever heard. And doing it while you're kind of teaching yourself how to be a podcaster on Oh, the yes. Fly. And I still don't know a lot about being a podcaster. Really? Really? I've listened to it. You seem to <laughs> you did a good job. have a knack for it. But Marty, kind of to flip it around a little bit. So you're trained as a surgeon, very successful, you know, with an amazing record. Um, that's, that's, a, that's an occupation that's kind of time consuming. I sort of wonder, one, um, where you find the time and energy to write three books, uh, two of which we've mentioned, but the third about your aunt that we were talking about earlier. Um, and how did you develop the reporting tools? Because one of the things that's very interesting to me about the price we pay is it's not as kind of uh, spoken from on high policy voice. This is actually a lot of on the ground reporting. I mean, wh what, what led you that way? Uh, so I realized there's a lot I don't know about journalism. And it, it, it's 
a humbling moment when a surgeon says, hey, I actually have no idea what I'm doing here, but I had that moment. And so I've been talking to so many journalists uh, like Laura over the years about their stories and our research. And I was fascinated by the fact that you can have a two week deadline and put together a story on conflicts of interest or fraudulent research as fast, 10 times, 100 times faster than we can do in a two year study that goes into a year of peer review in a journal that has a process yeah. that yeah. by the time it comes out, it's outdated and the policy makers have already passed laws. So I reached out to Marshall Allen, who's a health care mm. reporter at ProPublica, oh. a very seasoned senior reporter. He had done um, several pieces on patient safety and medical errors. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, would you edit this book uh, for me? Hmm. And so he essentially not only edited, but coached me through it, through the process. And um, he said, you know, for example, I discovered in one town in America that this hospital had sued about half the people in the small town for their unpaid medical bills and then chased them down and garnished their wages. And these patients were just devastated, right? And I realized all, all of a sudden, like, holy crap, you know, the, people don't live like me. I have a lot to be thankful for. God's been good to me. I have a good life. I'm a surgeon. And these half of America has less than $300 in savings on hand. And when they get a $6,000 surprise bill from their doctor or their hospital, that's catastrophic. And so I, um, even though it killed me, and I spent, gosh, countless weekends flying to towns in America, I think it was 22 uh, towns uh, by the time we were done with the book, and um, he'd tell me, you know, from um, his, um, you know, uh, position and he's he's actually in New York and I'm in Baltimore and he'd call me down and he's like have you traveled to New Mexico yet and I said no he's like you need to get down there you need to get on the ground I'm like Marshall we have all the data here we have all the court records we have everything we have the interviews he's like you have to get on the ground and I'd be like well I got cases on Monday I've got surgery it's gonna he's like you have to get on the ground and so getting on the ground I met one woman um, who invited me to her house She's a single mom, two kids, and I could not believe the conditions uh, that she was living in. And she told me the story of how her car was in the shop. She couldn't affair, uh, afford the $800 bill to get the car out of the shop, so she couldn't get to work. She worked two minimum wage jobs, and she was devastated by a $2,000 bill when her kid had asthma and went to the emergency room. That bill, I know for a fact, based on reference based pricing, should not have exceeded $600. Mm -hmm. um, that, I could only get that on the ground. So I learned so much on the ground, visiting um, you know, where, how an air ambulance company gouges patients, uh, talking to insurance companies, talking to doctors. You know, I'm convinced healthcare attracts good people, but we have perverse incentives and the system is messed up. We, we, we have good people working in a bad system. And when you talk to those people, they will tell you. For example, what is, how does a business buy health insurance? Well, there are health insurance brokers. I didn't even know this profession existed. And they have their own conferences. And I went to a conference, and you get a drink or two into them late night at the conference, and they will tell you our system is, the, our profession is messed up. We get paid giant kickbacks from the health insurance companies, so we don't always present all the options to the businesses, and they're getting ripped off left and right. We're making a killing, and it's wrong, and it's the untold dirty secret of why health insurance is, is going up so high. I don't know whether or not that's true, but I heard, heard it so many times from people on the ground that I was able to do a deep dive on how health insurance is sold to, to in businesses and give them guidance on how you should buy health insurance for your employees and pharmacy benefit plans. And uh, we've took, we had so much stuff that was yeah. like, oh my so, God, so we gotta tell somebody. Well, see, this is the thing. So you've gotta tell somebody. NYU trains a lot of uh, scientists, uh, uh, postdocs, PhD students, who want, like you, to kind of reach out to the public directly about their work. 
maybe they have issues they care about. And, and constant refrains, they're, they're always a little nervous about doing this because there's a, a widespread belief that there can be a professional cost to putting yourself as a researcher uh, out there. Uh, you know, that either this is a show off or, you know, you're, you're, you're really telling tales. Yeah. You're, you're revealing the dirty secrets. So I'm kind of wondering, yeah. you know, you're not a journalist. You're not a, a medical, yeah. you're, you're a surgeon. You work by referrals. You have, <laughs> you know, hospital privileges. It's a, it's a network. It's yeah. a thing. So have you, have you, is this cost you anything? I mean, is there a backlash here well, okay. because you keep shooting your mouth off about this stuff? If I may put it that way. I think any time you write a book or even an article, it, it will be perceived by some as self-promotional. And especially if the media sensationalizes the topic, especially if you get one blogger that goes off on it and calls it something, you know, um, I think there is a little bit of a um, bit of courage it takes to just talk frankly about this. I was talking to a doctor, prominent US surgeon um, recently, who just told me how he could not believe that another surgeon that he works close to openly says he only operates on people. He does an unnecessary surgery, or actually I would call it, has a borderline indication, sort of like back pain, mm -hmm. if they have a very favorable type of insurance that pays them well. He said this openly. And this, my friend, is, it's weighing on his ethics and his consciousness. We went into medicine for good reasons, and he's hearing this, and he's struggling with it. And I'm thinking, say something, speak up, talk to the department chair. And it is so hard. And I think one of the reasons why we don't have, for example, full negotiated price transparency of what insurance companies are actually paying and some of the other common sense reforms is almost everybody speaking up on healthcare today. All the experts, all the big panels at the big conferences, they are beholden to some giant special interest. They either work at a hospital and they're beholden to the hospital special interest, one of the three biggest lobbies in the United States. Uh, they're beholden to insurance companies, beholden to pharma, they're beholden to somebody, and you don't get the honest opinion. I know doctors who come up to me and they say, um, I totally agree with everything you're saying about the inappropriate care. I see it all the time. And I say, why don't you write something? Why don't you say something? Why don't you teach this to your students? And they're worried about their internal promotion at Aren't their you? institution. No, I don't care. You know what? Um, why not? Lee, let me be very honest with you. I'm a cancer surgeon. I break bad news all the time. You only live once. You got to speak truth. Who's going to challenge these special interests? When I met Jennifer in New Mexico, she's getting hammered by the system. People are getting crushed by their medical bills. 24% of Americans are not seeking medical care because of fear of being price gouged. If there's one thing in medicine that defines healthcare today, it's the business model of price gouging has taken over. Be it air ambulance, be it an ER visit, be it a mm -hmm. lab test, be it whatever. They pull themselves out of the master hospital bill, bill you separately, you're getting, people are getting gouged. One in five Americans has medical debt in collections. That's not who we are as a profession. Yeah. When Salk invented the polio vaccine, he refused to get a patent on it because he wanted every kid in the world to get it and he didn't want money to get in the way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Laura, so I'm curious. I'm sorry. Our profession is yeah. getting contaminated. Well, so I'm curious now. So here you've reported in exquisite and quite dramatic detail, sort of like the absolute kind of worst case nightmare scenario. And this is a local doctor. This is, a, this is in your hometown, Texas, your backyard. And I'm wondering how the medical community that stonewalled you when you were trying to report this, what kind of feedback did you get as this started to unfold? Oh my gosh. I, my inbox is still, I think, on fire. You know, with, um, I got so many emails from, well, they ran the gamut from people who said, I can't believe that anything like this ever happened to, oh, I could totally see how this would happen. You know, and, and a lot of it, when I'd say the, if I had to group a majority of responses uh, from any group, it would have to be nurses. So I heard a lot from Nurse, nurses. Nurses, OR nurses, who said, um, 
you know, it's hard when we, because of the, the power imbalance, it's really hard for us when we see a doctor who we don't think should be operating, because a lot of times it's the surgeon and then it's nurses, so the surgeons operate by themselves. And they have a lot of times a huge dilemma. Um, and I heard from a lot of nurses who were like, we've been talking, you know, we can't stop talking about what we would do if we saw this. And we've had a lot of lively discussions about how we, could we speak up, would we still keep our jobs? you know, if, if we did. I heard from t other doctors um, who, again, like, who said, you know, w this prompts a lot of discussion because the surgeons who were pushing back against Christopher Dench, they themselves had a lot of pushback at the time from their fellow doctors, like, why, you know, why don't you let this go? Why is this your problem? Yeah. And, and other, other doctors, you know, policing themselves. I've heard from um, medical schools Medical schools. Medical schools, residency. Because remember, this guy got out of residency, and he was operating straight out of residency. And one of the big unanswered questions of the podcast, because they wouldn't speak mm -hmm. at all, was how did he get out of residency? How did this? How did guy? How did a surgeon this bad even even finish a residency program? That question is still unanswered. And a lot of residency directors, you know, said, "How could you know? How could this happen?" Um, I, it really all walks of the medical community. There was, I think, the, the one of the gratifying things about telling a story like this is I can tell you there's been a lot of soul searching. And I'll tell you one of the most moving stories I got from a doctor. He was an anesthesiologist. And I, I, I don't want to give any uh, details that would, that would reveal anything geographically, but he had witnessed a bad surgeon. And he knew, he said that this particular surgeon had been responsible, he thought, for patient deaths, and like five or six. And now that surgeon was at another hospital. And he said, I can't tell you how much your podcast affected me because this surgeon um, was so terrible and I knew this surgeon was terrible and I never had the courage to say anything. Mm -hmm. And hearing these doctors who did have the courage and who said, it's affected me so much that I have had to retire because really? I because I cannot practice anymore because I am so guilt ridden. I've heard that. Yeah. Let me let me ask yeah. you something. So, you used to work for the Dallas paper. Yeah. Um, with a podcast, I mean, it's a one-off, more or less. You tell the story once and then you walk away. And just at the moment when you're actually getting an awful lot of like great tips, great follow-up material that in another universe in a different day would have been the source of many follow-up stories, um, a sustained reporting campaign perhaps uh, to address this problem that we all agree is a huge national issue, of course, that expresses itself locally, as all things do. What do you do with all this Wonderful follow-up material that you now have. You mean have. from other? Do I mean, I've gotten. Yeah, I've other gotten doctors, other lot. problems, other yes. hospitals. Yes. Oh my gosh, I've gotten tons yeah. of it. It it's, it would be depressing if I didn't know that this was uncommon. The number of of messages that I've received from people saying you really should look into this yeah. doctor. I mean, it's it's a lot. So what and do you do some, with that? So in some cases, it's been so bad that I've actually contacted local pap local reporters at papers, because I can't do, you know, another six-part podcast no. about another bad doctor. And so I have had conversations across the country with local reporters saying, hmm. hey, you know, here's this tip from somebody, you should, hmm. you know, you should keep an eye on this doctor. But I mean, it's hard because local papers, as you know, ha are hmm. struggling and don't have the manpower to do this. But I've had several conversations with local papers about doctors in their communities who, who I, I just wanted to put them on their radar. So that's what I've done, because I can't follow up about, you know, I can't, and I, I don't want to actually do like another story about another bad surgeon. I feel like um, that should be a job of someone locally to, to, to do it. And, and I had an advantage because I, that was local. I mean, that was in my backyard. Mm -hmm. And it would be really hard to report on one particular surgeon in, you know, Cleveland, in a, in a city that I didn't 
that I didn't live in, that I didn't have local contacts, that I couldn't follow up, that I couldn't be on the ground and drive no, over to somebody's no, house. No, but I mean, this is, this it seems to me is a dilemma that it's, it's the thing. You do a big series, you do a big investigative project, you shake the tree and the fruit mm -hmm. falls. Yes. And you're kind of not in a position to make use of that fruit. It must be no, but you know. I've tried to. I've I've tried to you know pass the fruit on to people who can. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know. So, so I think we have a question here. Sure. Uh, this is a question from someone on Twitter who wants to know. Um, you alluded to the fact that you are a freelancer and taking on this project wasn't necessarily an easy call. How do you make freelancing work for you day to day? Um, that's a that's a really good question. Um, Freelancers ask that of themselves all the time. Um, so in terms of making the call to do the podcast, um, it, it, it wasn't easy. In fact, uh, freelancers have a, a terrible, if you get freelancers together, everybody has their horror story of, of work that they did that they were not paid for because they did work for some publication and then the publication went out of business and then they didn't get paid. And even, and even magazines that are um, brand names that you recognize, sometimes they you know, declare bankruptcy and reconstitute themselves and you're, you're high mm -hmm. and dry. And given that Wondery was a new company mm -hmm. that I hadn't heard of, that they were asking me to commit a substantial amount of time um, to, to do, I said, okay, this is all well and good, but I wanna talk to your CEO and I wanna know how much money you have in the bank. Did you really? Oh yeah. You are a practical person. I said, Most journalists are not, so I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> No, I'm, I said, I want to get, I want to talk to your CEO. I want you to tell me how much money you have, and I want to know that I'm not going to do all this work, uh -huh. and then, you know, a few months in, you're going to come up and say, oh, you know, our company doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, Wondery's done the opposite. They've actually gotten more, you know, they're more successful even in the past year, but, but, and, and to their great credit, they said, okay. And I talked to the CEO, and I found out how much money they had, and and um, and I, you know, signed on to the project. But but it's 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 hard, and you have to have a mix of this isn't this isn't I didn't come up with this, but it's great advice when you're freelancing. Is you want a rule, and I've heard different numbers, but let's say the the five to one rule freelancing. So if you're doing five stories. You want the one that you're really passionate about, the one that you enjoy and the one that you really want to do, even though you, know, you may or may not be getting enough money to live off of. And then you got the four others that you're doing because you, your family has to eat. And so if you got that one that you're going all the time that you're passionate about and that you really enjoy, then you just supplement that, you diversify, and you do, you know, you do assignments that you may not enjoy, that you know, maybe not pay, and, so, and that's how you that's how you keep it going. But I, I would recommend you want to you just keep a variety of, of you know, paying customers across the way. So if you lose any particular one, you're not, you know, you're not high and dry. But the issue with the podcast was if I lost this particular one, I was completely screwed. Did you like, have to negotiate uh, movie rights and things like that? I mean, the, there was a serial. It's like it's an HBO thing. I think it's HBO. Right. I, I, did, I was completely new to an audio contract. Uh -huh. And um, so okay. I did not do as much negotiation because I had no, I had no idea. I had no idea what would go into the project. I had no idea about any of this, and um, I, I didn't negotiate that much. I mean, it seemed reasonable to me. Mm -hmm. And um, and and they, they, I want to say that that Wondery was not out to, to to completely take advantage of me either. I mean, I I was new to them too because when they did Dirty John they worked with Christopher Gofford who was a reporter for the LA Times so the LA Times was paying his salary so they didn't have to, to negotiate with an individual writer so it was new territory for them too so I didn't do that much negotiation um, so for example Dr. Death is going to be made into a movie you know and I, I, that's, I don't get any of that um, but I can tell you with contract number two <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it is interesting that podcasting has there was an era when, when, the, when magazine stories were kind of uh, picked over by, by uh, mm -hmm. wannabe producers very, very heavily, and podcasting has become like the next uh, mm -hmm. uh, source of, of uh, made-for-TV, this, that, and the other thing. Yeah. Um, Dan, do you have a question? I do. You I look do. expectant. So. I do. I'm ready. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about what journalists 
always do, which is we look for the compelling examples and we try to show that they're part of a systemic problem. One thing that we're really bad at, uh, and, and it's, it's hard enough to find those examples, it's amazing that, that Laura found them the way that she did, and, and Marty too on his travels, but we're even worse at writing about um, policy, you know, big picture, mm. health care. This might be totally naive on my part, but it feels like we're, we may in the next few years actually be moving toward a very large expansion of Medicare, maybe. Something single payer-ish. And we should be writing about that, but I think we really struggle, and one of the reasons is, is it's not clear what that would mean, actually mean for quality of care. So can you each talk about that a little bit? Would, would Dr. Death have had a harder time uh, killing his patients if, uh, if we had, a, a, if, if the incentives were different and we had a single payer type system? And Marty, the same thing for your explorations. Thank you. Well, I can tell you in this one situation that the, the question is how, how, how the income stream affects the care. And I mm. did, and I was very conscious of the fact, and I reported that actually in the story, that one of the things that kept propelling him and, and enabling him to get a job was that he was a neurosurgeon. He was a neurosurgeon. Neurosurgeons make a lot of money for a hospital. And I, one of the, the great quotes in there is I talked to a neurosurgeon uh, in Dallas um, about that and, and who, was, who was terrific and, and he'd been around a long time in, in doing neurosurgery and I said why did hospitals keep hiring him even though there were all these red flags and he said because I'm a cash cow you know I mean he just said that exactly you know right and that's so to answer the question I mean I, I can't say if a single payer would have stopped him sooner, but I can say that a lot of the reason that he, he kept on practicing had to do with the fact that there was money to be made, you know, and he could bring in a lot of money. Marty, you've given a lot of thought to the sort of the, the prescription cure. What, what, what would you say to answer Dan's question? Well, I think it's a great question that Dan brought up, and I would say to uh, you know a group of rising journalists in healthcare, I would um, point you to a few healthcare journalists that have done a lot of work to figure out who are who's writing about certain things and who has new ideas, and um, I would say there's about four healthcare journalists that have taken so much time to get to know me and our research. They've visited our research group. We've had long conversations. When I put out an idea, they will go and run it by the other stakeholders and test it. And I think it's those deep relationships where a journalist will really come up with gold. And so again, it's on the ground uh, work. It's uh, building relationships. Uh, one of my colleagues, Jerry Anderson uh, at Johns Hopkins, I think is the world expert on drug pricing. He's got some great ideas. There's a small group of journalists that have reached out to him. He'll talk to anybody. So um, I love seeing people interested in journalism. We need more of it. And um, what I'd love to see is what we do in medicine, which is we have hundreds of thousands of writers and researchers writing in a world that has like a two or three or five year lag time. And then journalism, which is very fact oriented, fact checking, get your evidence, there is editing, but it's a one week or one month or six month turnaround time and it affects policy and then we're talking in two separate silos and we're seeing, a, there's actually a bunch of us now in medicine, they're trying to merge that divide. One of our biggest uh, struggles is the traditional uh, editors of the medical journals. It's the internal promotions processes at medical schools where you only get promoted if you publish in certain journals. Well, we just had a back and forth with one of the top editors in the United States for a medical, leading medical journal. Which one? Um, journal of the American Medical Association, the number two and the number one in readership, uh, watering down our piece and rewriting individual sentences and um, taking out a sentence that says, 
Congress should repeal the 1987 um, am amendment that makes pharmacy benefit managers exempt from the Sherman Antitrust Act. We, that's the policy outcome. They said, we don't like to recommend legislative action, and they cut it right out, even though it was a sort of a commentary format. And the reason I'm a little afraid to say this with you in public and with the cameras on is we're all afraid of getting blackballed. Now, like I said, I'm a cancer surgeon. I don't care what people think of me. We'll find a place to publish it if the leading journals don't take it. But we feel that we have to write in a certain way. Mm -hmm. and that way hasn't changed in 100 years. And can we just say, look, we can talk to the public. We don't have to do it in this robotic format. And by the way, hardly anyone reads these things. We can write in the Wall Street Journal. Those have been some of the most effective articles where I've put out our research. I've literally told our team, this piece on hospitals suing patients mm -hmm. that's going to be coming out, if the medical journal, top medical journals don't take it, we'll take it straight to the American people in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And so thank you for doing journalism. If we had more healthcare journalists, we could have more accountability around one-fifth of the U.S. economy. There, there's an unlimited number of stories. Just talk to the doctors. Talk to the neurosurgeons. Come to that well, neurosurgery conference so, I was at. So, thank you. <laughs> but let me ask. So I'm a, I'm a, a, new, uh, a new reporter yeah. um, for reasons who knows why I'm interested in, in exploring medical issues and health care. Uh, where, where should I look? Where, where should you what, start? Where, what, what stone should I be turning over? Yeah. Call Ashish Jha, one of the smartest health policy minds at Harvard, and ask to have lunch with him. He'll say yes. I mean, I can't speak for him. But um, <laughs> these are our colleagues, and, and they have great ideas. They're practical. They've been on the ground. They know this, what the special interests need and want, so they have feasible ideas, not just mm -hmm. pie in the sky, academic ivory tower stuff. Get the Medicare data set. Medicare just released, in part from a lot of us demanding more transparency and some of the stuff that's come out of our writing. We have demanded that Medi Medicare claims data, saying it taxpayers paid for it, they deserve to see it. You can de-identify the patients. We now have data on physician practice patterns. We can tell who, which doctor is it, has a practice pattern that is extremely dangerous. When our research team sees that data and we can see the doctor's names, we think, holy crap, what do we do with this? And we're asking that question right now. No one has cut the data to look at individual practice patterns. Who brings a patient after a lumpectomy surgery? Brings them back more than 50% of the time to re-excise it. We have the names. What do we do with it? I'm, I'm looking for healthcare journalists to write about that and the other 400 practice patterns that we've cut in the national data. We've got these names. These doctors need help. They need some accountability. Let's start in a civil way. But if they don't respond, um, maybe we talked, we talked about sending the names to the professional society and saying, hey, just so you know, here are the top 10 most extreme doctors in this complication practice pattern that we see in the Medicare data. We'd encourage you to address this with them and create some accountability. Let's address this question. I've got another question from Twitter. Someone wrote to ask, we're talking about journalism as espousing the truth. The New York Times is waging a war against Trump on the premise of truth. How do you qualify truth, and what is the danger of defining what it is in particular situations? I, you know, I, unfortunately, journalism has a great tradition, which I think, like medicine, incredibly noble tradition. I know so many journalists, unfortunately, that are so out to take Trump down that the, they let that personal sense of, I guess it's patriotism they feel, get into their writing. I gotta be honest with you. I met with Trump a few weeks ago. I met with Secretary Azar. I met with uh, Seema Verma, head of CMS, all separately. I have been so impressed at the responsiveness to some of these new ideas that we've put out there. The physician, or sorry, the pharmacy uh, rebate, the mm -hmm. so-called rebate that, um, that's not a rebate. It's a kickback to the middlemen. They call it a rebate because it sounds like, oh, I got a rebate in the supermarket. It's a nice thing. No, it's a kickback to the middlemen. We explained all that to them. They got it. They were actually already on top of it. They announced no more kickbacks to middlemen. They want 100% of those so-called rebates to go directly to the patient instead of all the middlemen taking the money out of the system. 
Now we'll see if it passes the rules and the legal challenges. They're listening and they're doing some really good stuff. So, I mean, there's good and bad. And unfortunately, when we see some of these good announcements, I know too many healthcare journalists that are saying, basically, you know, this makes Trump look good, so we're not gonna cover it. And I'm seeing that bias. They just, Wall Street Journal this week said that they want, the administration is gonna push for total transparency of the negotiated prices that are paid at that amount from insurance companies to hospitals. Totally lifting the veil on price transparency would create intense competition, cut waste, lower premiums. Got one Wall Street Journal article. Thank you, by the way, for writing for the Wall Street Journal. They covered it. <laughs> but this is like major news. This is gigantic. Um, so some things to keep in mind in, in healthcare journalism. So do you see a difference as a journalist between facts and the truth? So what I see is journalists, no journalist that I know, and we know a lot of journalists have been doing this a long time, no journalist that I know, I don't think would willingly report anything that's wrong. Like wouldn't set out and, and, and you know, do a story with an idea that what they're reporting is not right or that their facts are wrong. The trap I can see is, and that I do see, is um, journalists falling into the trap of their own confirmation bias. I wanted to ask you about that, so please. I, I do see that. Like journalists who, who might think in their head, you know, this, I know the story, I, I know, you know, I know this, you get, a, you get a tip on a story and you think, oh, well, this is it. And, and therefore you find the facts and the individual facts might be true. I, I don't think any journalist would, again, report a, a, a fact that is incorrect if they knew it was incorrect. But you can, you can put the facts together and you can see the facts that support the narrative that you already believe and feed into that. And you publish your story. And you would have a story that would, that would be factually true, but not, the, the individual facts might be true, but the overarching truth might not be. And I can't see, I, I don't even know if journalists realize that. And I don't think most journalists would do it, but I can see, and I do see, and I'm sure we've read stories like that, that are, um, where, where journalists, um, you know, aren't constantly asking themselves, okay, well, what's an alternative explanation for what I'm seeing? Or what, you know, am I falling? You know, and I'm not seeing, saying I'm immune to this. I mean, every journalist, every person, you know, falls victim to their own confirmation bias. And that's what I could see happening, is individual facts would be true. And I don't know of a journalist who would report an individual, you know, report facts that aren't true. But I could see them being pieced together in a way that is not true. And I've seen this in science stories. You know, this is the sort of pack journalism. I think so. It, it's either, well, it's, it's an interesting balance. It's either pack journalism, uh, which happens when journalists might not ask the hard questions or might do, or like in the early days of robotic surgery, isn't this great? Or it's an attempt to so much be not the pack that you, you, know, you want to be edgy and you want to report this story and, and you're not, and so you r report on the other side something that may or, you know, that may not be, you know, that may not be true I, I can I can see that I, I I can't see a journalist willingly reporting something that's not true but I can see them being blinded by their own confirmation well, it, you know this gets into uh, into Dan's question I think which is oftentimes the difference between you Marty who are a policy person but you're out doing journalistic things you're out in the field you're talking to people at health fairs you're meeting ladies with bills and things you know, those are all journalistic techniques, but you're confident in your policy judgment. And I think, I don't want to speak for you, but we're sort of trained, that's exactly what we're trained not to be confident in, mm -hmm. that that's somebody else's job to come up with a solution. So you didn't really answer Dan's question, which is why I'd like to bring it back. So are the things that we're talking about, these sort of systemic flaws, medical error, the costs that you're very passionate about, are these baked into this system? And if we change the system to 
to use the example Dan put forward, a single payer model, would, would those problems disappear? You know, I, I am from Washington, D.C., so we're very good at not answering questions directly. <laughs> But I would say, here's the problem with, so single payer is very attractive, especially right now, because it cuts a lot of the middleman right out, and it makes the things very direct, people right? that you say are the problem. And the, this pharmacy benefit manager kickback, the GPO, all those things get eliminated instantly with a single payer system. It's very attractive right now, especially with record levels of waste. Here's the problem with single payer. 10 years, 20 years into it, Every country in the world that's ever adopted it invariably cannot resist a tightening of the belt a little more every year, a little more every year, a little more every year. You go down the road, it is a massively underfunded infrastructure. We've already seen it with Medicare. Medicare cut every year a little more, a little more, a little more. I'll come in in the middle of the night now, take out someone's appendix at 2 a.m., do all kinds of you know difficult work and get paid $230 or something like that. That used to be a $1,000 case, but every year it gets cut, cut, cut. So I don't think Medicare for, for All um, is a lasting solution. It's the short-term, immediate appeal, but over time, let me give you a very, a million times better alternative to Medicare for All. Make full price transparency, including the negotiated prices for all shoppable services, totally transparent and let competition eliminate the waste in the system. And that's why I wrote the book, The Price We Pay, is I heard so many people in their profession in medicine, that is in their, their job in the healthcare industry, say, my job as doing this is a total joke. If we had fair competition, we would be, you know, I, I would not even need to even exist. January 2018, healthcare became the number one business in the United States. That's not something to be proud of. Record rates of inappropriate care and doing stuff. So I, I do not think Medicare for all is a real solution. We need price transparency. The administration right now, and thanks to the Wall Street Journal, wrote one piece, and only got one article. They are considering total price transparency of the actual negotiated prices. So we can see what the real price is, not some jacked up artificial price that's 25 times higher what they would take from insur some insurance company uh, for the same service. There's, there's, th there's a joke going on and the joke is on the American patient. Jacking up a bill and then having some secret deal. If you go to a restaurant, there's not a menu for you and you and you and a minority and a person who works for this company and a special interest. There's not six menus. There's one menu and if we had that in healthcare, people could shop. Do you think, can yeah. I ask a yeah, question? Yeah, no, please, please. Because I, I wonder if people are aware of that because if, if people think that medicine operates under the normal rules of capitalism when it, when it doesn't. Because I have heard this argument, we just need to let you know, the market forces do it, get the government out of healthcare. This is a very popular theme. And yet, I, I don't know if they realize that it, it might have the illusion of capitalism, but it isn't really. How much awareness do you think people have of how, how, um, how much they pay is, is a result of? I think more and more, thanks to healthcare journalists like Sarah Cliff and others that are writing about the absurdity of the $40,000 you know, rabies uh, shot and, and stories like this. Um, right, right now, the price transparency train has left the station. It's got tremendous momentum. The American people love it. Who doesn't like transparency? But it's, the, right now there's an attempt to hijack it with this argument. People don't shop based on price. Few people look at the prices, and when they do, they pick the more expensive thing. That is a distracting conversation because even though only a fraction of people will use the price to shop, Proxies use the prices, health plans use the prices, employers who are shopping on your behalf use the prices, insurance companies that are sculpting their in-network um, uh, centers use the prices, so proxies use the prices. And we're hearing this argument, which is an old argument from an old study, oh, if you show somebody the price and they're not paying, they pick the most expensive thing. Well, guess what? The average deductible in, in the United States is like $5,000 
people are starting to pay and some people look at prices and that'll drive the market to, to change and then the proxies will drive the market to change. So don't ever let anyone ever tell you price transparency is not going to work because people don't look at prices. Um, that's a distraction. So, so Laura, if, if you went back to Wonderly and you said, you know, I've got this great story idea. I want to do a story on podcast on price transparency. I mean, w would that happen? It depends. You would have to... Um, you would have to find a way to tell that story. This is the challenge that you brought up earlier. You would have to find a way to tell that story that makes it, you know, relevant and engaging for people. And there are reporters who do that. You mentioned Marshall Allen. Marshall's a master at, at being able to tell policy stories in a way that makes them completely um, engaging to, to people. So. I think yes, it would just depend on how you tell it, how, how you tell the story. And these are, you know, one reason journalists don't do it more is one, it's hard. It's hard to do this. I think also still a lot of journalism, I mean less and less, but it's happening in local newsrooms and they don't have the resources, they don't have the time, they don't have the ability to be able to tell these stories of, of individual patients and how they're affected. So, to answer your question, I think yes. It just depends on you would have to figure out a way to tell it in such a way that people are going to go past you know the first fifteen minutes of episode one and not think this is boring. Was that a theoretical question? Because if she wants to do a podcast on the new book, I'm, I'm <laughs> excited, I'd be happy about that. Well, it's not a theoretical question in the following way. As we started at the beginning. This is a much told story. Um, there is no secret that America has a problem with the healthcare system, with costs, with medical error. And these are things that articulate policy uh, uh, analysts and, and uh, brilliant uh, medical journalists have well aired and well discussed. And yet, we are still in the station. And whether the train pulls out that way and goes to single payer or whether it's really the state boards that certify surgeons need to be reformed or whatever. We, we seem to be stuck. And I find that curious because every journalist wants to change the world and uh, every healthcare policy analyst wants to change the world in a shape that they have in mind. Um, I just is curious to me why this particular thing seems to be so intractable. I, I, I can't answer that. I'm not a policy person. I mean, when you look at... <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm out yeah. there trying to tell the stories to, to, get, to, to, you know, to get things to change. I'm not in a position to make the changes. Um, so I don't know. It's a good question, but I can't answer it. I'm actually incredibly optimistic about the future of health care, and it has nothing to do with the government. What we're seeing right now with employers fed up with the traditional way of doing business. They're doing direct contracting based on value to hospitals. We're seeing bundles move us away from the fee-for-service system. We, we're seeing young people believe in holistic care that's good primary care and not just over-treatment. I mean, I am actually very optimistic about the future of healthcare. I think sometimes things have to totally shatter for us to start over. And um, it's a lot of it's messaging, and that's why I, look up to journalists like Laura so much is storytelling, good journalism, and research is, needs to all blend together. And I agree, Marshall Allen does that well. We saw the uninsured in America, in part, that problem got addressed rallying around one number, 44 million. They said it a million times, 44 million people had no health insurance. Guess what? That galvanized people and they rallied around and that number is much lower today. Right now, I think we need to talk about the bubble. We need to talk about 24% of Americans are avoiding medical care because fear of the bills. And we need to talk about predatory billing and change our lexicon. And I think what the movie I loved the most was The Big Short. And I loved it because it took a boring and complex subject, the financial crisis, and made it understandable to an everyday person that knew nothing about that industry. And that's what I try to do with the price we pay. I call it the big short for healthcare because 
PBMs, insurers, all this stuff is so complicated. How do you present it in a way that's understandable? Well, somebody can say, no, it's, it's not up to the experts and we can't understand it. It's pretty simple. The banks were spending money they didn't have using our money. No. There's over uh, charging and there's mm -hmm. lack of transparency in the, in the money in medicine. I have a question here in the shadows that yeah, should emerge into the light. <laughs> really interesting things to fact check from tonight's event. I was curious um, <laughs> about the kind of classic journalistic problem um, when dealing with sources who have suffered from traumatic events. Mm -hmm. And I was curious mm -hmm. if you could speak to that, especially with like the kind of personal medium of like the voice and hmm. what that was like in the reporting process for you on your podcast? It's a great question. It, it is a great question and it is something that I wrestle with. So this is the thing and, and if you, all of us who write about medicine, um, you have this dilemma of how do you talk to people and you're quite regularly asking people to tell you about the worst thing that has ever happened to them. And so how do you get that story and, and tell their story in a way that's respectful, and yet it doesn't exploit the pain that they feel? And, and getting that balance right is extremely important. And, and especially when I was doing a story like Dr. Death, because it was, I mean, what these people had been through was terrible. I mean, it was absolutely horrible what they had, what they had suffered. And, and I didn't want to use their suffering for purposes of entertainment and being salacious. And yet at the same time, you also had to know They're how terrible he was. making a movie out of it, right. Right, yeah. and you had to know how terrible a surgeon he was. And so if you'll notice, those of you who have listened to the podcast, the, the first episode is pretty intense. It's pretty intense describing the details of what he did wrong and the suffering that he caused. And and as, as the story goes on, there's less and less of the details. There's, there's enough, but there's, you know, there's less about these patients after the first couple of episodes, because also there's the incidents of his best friend who ended up a quadriplegic. And so, but then, because I, I felt like you didn't need to know. You didn't need to know the suffering of every patient after that. You didn't need to know the details. And so, so there was, that was one of my solutions. And then, and then every detail, was, I mean, I agonized over, like, how much do I say? How much do I do? How much, how much is enough to, to convey the suffering without, without crossing that line? And I can tell you that the first episode, I mean, altogether there were probably about 40,000 words of copy over the whole scripts, but the first, that first episode was probably rewritten 10 or 12 times at least. You know, it was re-recorded several times. You know, to, mm -hmm. because you, we would go back and we would listen and you, you know, it, it, to, to walk that balance. So I, I don't have a formula and I don't have an answer. I can just tell you it's, it, it is something that I wrestle with and, and other reporters wrestle with, is that you don't want to exploit people's pain. One thing that I always am very conscious of and that I try to do in my, both in my report, you don't make someone the product of their pain. In other words, I always try to ask, you know, who were you before this happened? Tell me about you. Tell me about your family. Tell me about you as a person. And I'm trying to convey with that. I see you. I see you as an individual. I don't just see you as, you know, this thing that, this thing that happened to you. And mm -hmm. then I try to convey that in the story. Like these are actual, these are not props in your mm -hmm. story. These are human beings. You're not I, doing the, uh, the famous Janet Malcolm thing of, you know, seducing the source and getting them to, yeah, no, you know, no. set and, and them up to do the thing. Right. You know, and, and there are, there are make details. Make them cry. Yes. You know, make them cry. No. And, and there audio. are details that I, and there are details that I leave out, you know, and, and sometimes they're, sometimes they are very compelling details, but sometimes they just, it feels too invasive. And I have to say, even about Dunch, there were details um, about, not about him personally, but about his relationship with his children, you know, things that we had on hmm. tape about his own personal life details that, um, that we left out because we didn't even want to invade his relationship with his children because it's not their fault. They're, they're not the story. They're not what happened. So, so um, it is something we always have to be conscious of. It's something I have to be conscious of, and I'm not uh, alone uh, 
um, in that. But it's, it's a good question. It's something that, that, as a journalist, you will do your whole life. You know? I have a question in the shadows there from Ivan Aransky, co-founder of Retraction Watch and distinguished writer in residence at New York University. <laughs> <laughs> Called in the big guns here. Thank you. Th thank you, Lee. Well, uh, then I guess it's OK if I try if you don't mind, to maybe get back to this question. I think you've asked twice now, um, and I'm going to ask a third time. And maybe I'll ask Costelli differently, like journalists do. Uh, Marty, you mentioned the big short. I love the big short. I think I understood that. Who knows if I actually understood it. What got me about the big short, other than the movie and understanding everything, was at the very end. There's, and a lot of people I ask about this actually don't remember it. Very end, right in the sort of, it's a postscript almost, a sort of epilogue. It's a little, you know, right at the top of the screen in text, a story, and I don't remember if it was Bloomberg or Reuters. Um, oh, by the way, they've come back with these credit default swaps. They've just called them something different. And it's 2016 or whatever year that was, right? Almost 10 years later after the, after the crash. Um, every Sherpa here who graduated, I think it was after 2009, 2010, will know this story, so you can just sort of tune out for a second. But, <laughs> I, one of the Sherpies, um, who I later hired at, at Reuters, uh, you know, came and wanted to do a story in class, and it was about the fact that all of the evidence says the best way to treat heroin addiction among prisoners, in other words, you know, they come into prison, they're addicted to, and it could be any opiate really, but it's, you know, heroin in particular, is to give them heroin. The evidence is actually pretty clear. I mean, it's not like there's thousands of studies, but what evidence there is is pretty clear. And actually, nobody debates that. And he said, I'm, I'm just going to call the warden and say, why on earth are you not giving heroin to you know, prisoners? I said, that is awesome. You should do that. <laughs> but here's what you should also do. You should call the guy who's running against the legislator. It was Texas, of course, <laughs> wh who, you know, who is running on a platform of you know, don't give heroin to prisoners, and the guy who's running against him saying, I think it's a really good idea because the evidence, the scientific evidence says so. And I want you to, s well, first figure out who's going to win that election. I'm going to bet you a real nice dinner on it. In Texas. In Texas. What we're up against is, you know, we do the great journalism. We write the great books. We hear the policy stories over and over. We're convinced. We've convinced ourselves. And yet, actually translating policy policy stories to, or excuse me, actually translating evidence to good mm -hmm. policy remains, as far as I'm concerned, one of these stubborn, stubborn problems uh, of, of journalism, of legislation, of our, our, our world. So how do we do that? I mean, I'm not asking you to give me the 10 second version, but how do we do that? Because we've known about this for a long time. Lucian Leap in 1999, and he wasn't the first one. So what do we do? Is that a question, sir? <laughs> what do we do? What do, do you do? do? You own a big. You Are you asking a me? You what own I do? a big megaphone. I do own a big. Well, I don't own it. Well, you know no. what I mean. I'm sort of. You have it's you have important. command. You have command of a big uh, voice box. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, and I'm not claiming that this is an evidence-based way of going mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. it. But and and when Laura was talking about, you know, all these stories that you now are being told and people are tipping you and emailing you and, and what have you and um, that, that's my life, right? So at Retraction Watch, we are constantly, we hear far more stories than we could ever do. I mean, even at our height, we couldn't do a fraction of them. Um, but I actually really believe that it's important to keep up that drumbeat and to tell the stories of, and in this case, the vulnerable, tell the stories of the misconduct, of the fraud, of the bad surgeon right, of the mur almost murderous surgeon. Um, I actually think that's really important because what happens then is what you did, which is that you call it the attention to a local reporter. And that local reporter may or may not have anything to do it. We do that all the time. Um, we <coughs> like to break the story, and then I call someone at a local paper, right? Um, done that in Baltimore. I've done it everywhere. Sometimes they pick it up, sometimes they don't. I'm happier when they give us credit for breaking the story. Let's put it, I'll be honest about that. We all have our incentives. But, you know, you, you, I think you got to do that. Um, but you also do have to do what you both do, all three of you, but tonight's guests really do, which is to connect 
those stories to the actual policy. And there are people who do mm. it well. Um, and Marshall's one of them. Uh, I, I, I do think we have to do that. And that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to do. That's what my staff at Medscape is trying to do. But I, I don't claim that that's a solution. Because if it was, I wouldn't ask, have to ask the question. Mm -hmm. Do you have a quick answer? Because we have some questions behind it. Not a quick one. Not a quick one? I mean, I, um, what Ivan's doing is what I, he was one of the people I was referring to when I said we're trying to bridge the medical journals and journalism together. That's what Medscape's doing. That's what other outlets are doing. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're, we've become intoxicated with a false lexicon. In medicine, they've defined evidence as a, in, in a pyramid. Level 1A is a randomized controlled trial. 1B is this. Level two, well, guess what? You don't need a randomized controlled trial to prove that a parachute works. And we can learn more from outliers than we can sometimes from giant trials that tend to be in the same ethnic or gender group. There's a patient that had brain cancer that was a long-term survivor at Johns Hopkins. Why did that patient survive and no one else did? Turns out they had an infection. Maybe it stimulated the immune system. Maybe something happened. We can learn more from that one patient. Hmm. So I think we use a false lexicon uh, sometimes I'm actually a little so there's the bucket of doctors and hospitals healthcare will find a workaround and you'll be back at the ending of the big short but then there's stories like the f completely f um, uh, the horrible messaging around hormone replacement therapy making inappropriate conclusions from a study that never made those conclusions 90% of doctors will say it causes cancer even though it doesn't the studies in the New England Journal of Medicine but it was mis represented in the media and the doctors believe it, that is a giant uh, thing that needs to be overturned and a good healthcare journalist could do that. Um, and that's one of those things that okay. high impact. I have my assignment, so do you. And we have another question. Hi, um, I have a question about the media and television and how good of a job do you think these media produces for um, shows like New Amsterdam or Good Doctor or um, Grey's Anatomy, how good of a job are they doing in portraying these um, health issues and informing the public about them? A great question. I yeah. don't know if she knows. No, she knows. not only she does, so um, why don't you share? So uh, after I wrote the book Unaccountable, I got a call from Hollywood saying we want to turn it into a TV series, The Resident. So the Resident TV show, uh, the sh TV series called The Resident, um, which is now in season two um, doing well in its ratings and it's got a, it looks like a good future life has really I thought done a good job bringing certain issues to the general public some of the stuff is sensationalized some of the stuff is Hollywood and a soap opera some of the stuff offends doctors because it's not medically super accurate sometimes but as they're spending more money on the show they're delivering messages season two is about the medical device industry the good and the bad Season three, I don't know if I can say this in public, but what the heck, will be about <laughs> medical billing and the predatory billing. Um, Over-treatment is in season one. So I think we're, we need to use every avenue out there. When Obama went on The Late Show and they said, why are you, you as president going to The Late Show? He says, some people will only get their information from avenues like this. And I think we need to use everything to educate people about the issues in healthcare today. Okay. We are running to the end. Do you have a thought you'd like to add to that? Not about medical television, if that's what the no, accuracy just of depiction? How good a job oh. the fiction industry is doing. I wish I could. Highlighting I, these issues. I really don't know. I don't watch it, you know, my daughter watches Grey's Anatomy. She might be able to, but I, I don't, um, I, haven't, I haven't really watched the shows, so I, I can't speak on that at all, because I, I, I have I think we have time for one more question. Sir? So, uh, I did find an article about the price transparency, not in the Wall Street Journal. It was a newspaper named NYT. Uh, so, uh, and in that article, uh, it said, um, uh, if you're the only hospital in town, does it matter? Because the prices can be transparent, but it's still the only game. So is transparency really the only solution totally to this problem? Well, first of all, we can call out gouging. Gouging is completely inconsistent with medicine's mission and it's completely inconsistent with a hospital's nonprofit tax-free status. So we've actually been calling hospital CEOs that are engaging in egregious price gouging and saying, you know, 
we know exactly what's happening. This is one-tenth the price. This patient has had horrible financial hardship from this. We did not in medicine take an oath to treat a patient and then put them in financial ruin. That's not who we are as a profession. And so we're trying to create some accountability okay. around that. Okay. So Laura, transparency. As a journalist, how do you feel about transparency? <laughs> well, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> I'm in favor of it too. Yes. And I actually think that we uh, sadly have, have come to the end of this conversation, although we still have an awful lot to talk about. Um, the two of you have taken something that's been plaguing us for more than a generation, and you've given us something new to think about, and some hope that perhaps there are some solutions out there, both in ways to cover it and ways to fix it. And for that, I thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I hope the informal conversation.